people say, Amen. You may be seated. Well, we go now to the third part of our series, the final uh, part of our part series on crossroads. And uh, two weeks ago, we talked about Zacchaeus' crossroad and that personal decision to come to Jesus. Uh, last week, we talked about the, the corporate decision of a group of people listening to him and, and being challenged with the decision. And this week, we find another group of people listening to him and being challenged with the crossroad, with the question, the, what are the things that make for peace? And in the Bible, we find that there's always three things that are talked about with peace. Number one, first peace, is that peace of salvation and, and peace with God. We call that the vertical peace, where we give our lives to Jesus Christ, where we recognize he's our Savior. So peace number one is we have peace with God, forgiveness of our sins, forgiveness of our brokenness before God. Peace number two, then, is the peace that is between people, and we call this the horizontal peace. That as God keeps working on people's hearts, there is a horizontal peace that takes place and it changes people. It can even change nations. Nations who have hated each other for forever because nothing is impossible with God. And so if individuals' vertical peace is changed by their relationship with God, it begins to affect the horizontal peace with people with each other. And then the third peace that the Bible talks about, it's the internal peace. It's never an ivory tower prob, pr promise that you won't have problems and you won't have struggles. You will. Everybody know that? If we're on planet Earth, we will have, Jesus even said it, in this world you'll have what? Tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. The third kind of peace is the peace as he walks with us and guides us to more peace even as we face difficulties. In our passage in Luke today, we get the Palm Sunday passage, but you're going to notice in Luke, if you watch carefully, there's no palms there. It's in the other Gospels, so we call it Palm Sunday still. But listen now to this passage, uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. After Jesus had said this, that was last week's teaching, now we're here. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead of them and he went up to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and as he approached Bethphage and Bethany on the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt. Tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of his disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If they kept quiet, the stones themselves will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's pray. Lord, help us to recognize your visitation. For just as it was true back then, it still is true now. You keep 
visiting and reaching for souls and lives. You keep offering to intervene in places where there is unforgiveness and war and terror. And you keep reminding us that if we will receive you, lo, you are with us always to the close of the age. We will not face anything by ourselves, even as we still face many things. You will be our peace. Oh Lord, put this upon our minds and put this upon our heart. We ask this and we pray this, oh God, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may all of God's people say, Amen. To know the time of one's visitation. Well, a little background information on this day. First of all, Jesus is entering into what city? Jerusalem. Anybody know what the definition of the city Jerusalem is? It literally means city of peace. The same root for Salem is of shalom, where people greet each other and say peace. Okay? So it is literally called the city of peace. Could there be any more ironic name for it? because it still struggles to find peace today. The Passover is near. If everybody, real quick, Passover was the time when Israel came out of slavery in Egypt and headed toward the promised land, and the God intervened there with the, uh, the uh, angel of death, and where the angel of death saw the blood of the lamb on the doorstep, the angel of death did what? It passed over. What a great fitting sign for us today, that where death sees the blood of the lamb, it passes over it can't touch it. They're waving palms. Why are they waving palms? Luke, Luke didn't even include this, but some of the other Gospels do. Why are they waving palms? Well, about 160-ish years before this time, probably about 190 years at this point, there was a group of people called the Maccabees. Anybody ever heard of the Maccabees? Okay. If you get some Christian traditions have Bibles that they have the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, they have the New Testament, and right in between they have this, this group of books called the Apocrypha. And in the Apocrypha, there's first and there's second Maccabees. Now, Christianity at large has looked at the Apocrypha and said it's, it's, not, it's not canon, it's not Bible, but there's some information there that's important to understand and know. And so for some traditions, it's a little more important. The Maccabees were a group of people that before Rome came in, there was this period of a war that lasted um, about four years, but there was a period of a, about five, six years where Israel actually had independence. And the palm branch became associated with the Maccabees and that last gasp of independence, of self-rule. And they believed, they associated the, the, the palm branch with the coming of Messiah who was going to set them free. Does that make sense now? So when they're waving their palm branches, it's a sign of independence. When they're quoting the Psalms, they were quoting this very special Psalms called the Messianic Psalms, which are the Psalms that talk about Messiah coming. So this scene that we get here, Passover is coming, people are starting to fill the city, the religious leaders are nervous because they're afraid of a riot, the Romans are on edge because all these people are here and they're afraid of an uprising, and these, these people are swelling, and Jesus comes in riding on a donkey, a symbol of peace, not what they thought. He's talking about the peace of God can come to us and set us free. He comes riding in on this donkey, and they're waving palm leaves, kind of like our 4th of July, independence, political. And they're crying out the Messianic Psalms, kind of like our Easter, spiritual freedom. And so this is what's going on in this scene when he comes riding into Jerusalem. Now, what we run into is there's opposition to this immediately. The Pharisees... Say, teacher, rebuke them, stop it, don't let them, don't let them talk that way. Why would the Pharisees not want the people crying out messianic uh, psalms and singing messianic hymns? What did the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, what did they want? Power, status quo. If we upset the Romans, they're going to shut us down. We got to stay as we are and keep this religious, political situation so that they won't shut us down. The Romans are nervous too. Why are the Romans afraid? 
Because there's a, the, the city is swelling with patriotism. They're worried about a problem. They're looking for power, not peace. And God has come to usher in peace. We get this, this picture. And all of a sudden, Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives, which is prophesied that's how Messiah would enter. He's coming down the Mount of Olives on this donkey. And he gets a view of Jerusalem. He knows he's going to the cross. Again, I've said this last three weeks. If I, if I was Jesus and I knew I was going to the cross, I wouldn't be that much concerned with people around me. I'd be trying to figure out how am I going to do this. He once again is concerned about the world around him. He looks at the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace, and he begins to weep over it. In this sense, he's, he's, he's crying over the city. He's weeping over Jerusalem, the city of peace. And he says to them, you don't have peace. And you won't until you stop being blinded by the things you think you want, by the things you think are your treasures, by the things that the world says are the most important thing. You lack peace, and the reason you lack peace is because it's hid from your eyes. Pharisees, Sadducees, Ascends, a, a group of people that removed themselves because they didn't like the, the pollution that was going on in their religion, so they just removed themselves. They're, they're involved in the Dead Sea and stuff like that, okay? Dead Sea Scrolls, that kind of stuff. Um, zealots! You're trying to overthrow uh, Rome by, by violence. Sadducees, Pharisees, you're protecting your power. Romans, what are you chasing? You won't control the world forever. You lack peace because it's hidden from your eyes. The Greek word for hidden here is crypto. Does that make sense when we think of our English cryptology and stuff? Crypto means, it can literally mean it's hid, but, but it also means the person that it's hidden from is unable or unwilling to see it. It's, it's kind of like this. Men, has this ever happened to you? Your wife tells you to go to the refrigerator, to go to some cupboard somewhere, and to fetch something, and it's supposed to be right there, but when you get to it, it's not there. You open up the refrigerator, you're moving the salad dressing, you're moving the mayonnaise, you're moving the pickles, and it's not there. Has this ever happened to any men in here? Okay. Then you say to your wife, sweetheart, I can't find it. And what does she do? She comes right to the refrigerator, and there it is. It's like little owls came and hit it on you, and then all of a sudden it's right there. Has this ever happened to anybody? Ladies, I am convinced that men are crypto. To finding the stuff behind the mayonnaise. We can't do it. So stop asking us to. You're going to have to come and find it anyway. They won't move the mayonnaise and see what the kingdom is about. Unable, unwilling, they won't do it. And Jesus weeps, and he gives, this, he gives this brief sermon about the future. There will be the day when your walls of your great city will be surrounded. They will build a rampart up to it. They will breach the walls, and everyone inside will be destroyed. Everything will be utterly leveled. And then there's oh, this terrible verse. They'll even kill your children. This is probably the year 29 A.D., in 41 years, the temple and the city would be destroyed by Rome. The walls would be leveled. Almost every man, woman, and child in the city would be killed, children, violently. The Romans were really upset. It had been a long siege. It had been an expensive siege. They were upset. They didn't like this kind of advertisement. And they showed no mercy on these people. 
of the temple, only the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall remains today in the area that was the Temple Mount. You can still go and see evidence of the destruction of what took place. You would not see, Jesus said, because you didn't know the time of your visitation. Episcope is this word for visitation. And it's a word that, that's come within the life of the church to mean a bishop or an overseer, episcope. But what episcope really means is it means the time of your examination, the time of the investigation. See, what is a bishop? He investigates, examines the condition of the church and tries to help it to be in the right condition. But this word literally means you did not know the time of your investigation, of your examination upon the heart. And you will not find peace until you realize today is the day of our examination, of our investigation of where we are with Jesus. There will be no peace until that happens. Now, as I said, the Bible talks about three kinds of peace that Jesus wants to give us. The first piece, what we talked about, vertical peace. The peace between us and God for the forgiveness of what? Sins. It's just, just like what I was talking about with the kids today. It is the point that we come to the point where we say, I am a sinner. Everybody know there's a sinner in here today? Sinner means you, you, we miss the target. Everybody is. Everybody is. The point where we say, I am a sinner, I need peace with God through what Jesus Christ did on the cross, what we're going to talk about Friday, the crucifixion. Why did he go through such a horrible, barbaric death? So that we could have spiritual peace, call it redemption, and that we could know we have peace with God. And I'm not perfect, I'll never be perfect, but he's with me and that begins to change everything. Does that make sense? That's peace number one. Piece number two is once God is in our heart, once Christ has redeemed us, once his atonement has redeemed us, all big church words, once his sacrifice has touched our lives and forgiven us, it begins to do a work in our lives that creates a peace. But now the peace of the vertical begins to feed the peace on the horizontal. So that means I look at Ron and Ron looks at me. Doesn't mean that not every now and then we might do something to irritate each other. We don't. We don't. That's why I picked on you, Ron. Okay? Yeah, there can be people who don't get along. Happens every now and then, right? But it means that Christ wants to bring peace among people, even among nations. Even in families, yep, your family as well as mine. Yep, we all got those families, don't we? He wants to bring forgiveness, and he wants to bring grace, and he wants to bring new starts. And I don't have any, any control over whether that person out there forgives me, but I have control whether the bitterness affects me, don't I? And so he sets us free on the horizontal level from bitterness, and he changes the way we interact. And even Jews and Arabs can forgive each other. Even Catholics and Protestants can forgive each other. Even the Hatfields and McCoys can find peace. So first is spiritual peace. Second is peace among people. And the third peace is internal. If the polls are correct, America totally lacks peace right now. Everybody's mad at everyone. Everyone points a finger at everyone. Everyone watches their news shows that tell them exactly what they want to hear. And they know the other people are the devil. Am I correct? We look at the stock market and we get freaked out. We look at our pension amounts and we fall apart. Doctor calls. Houses, property, stuff. It all has a way of taking our peace, doesn't it? But Jesus said, if you will know the time of your visitation, the time of the examination, even with these things, they will happen. But even with these things, I will help you. 
I will guide you. I will comfort you. I will give you wisdom. I'll even cry with you. But we'll get through it together. That's the third kind of peace. The Bible tells us that in order to know these pieces of peace, we need to study the Bible to know what? There's promises in there, isn't there? There's promises here, there's promises here, there's promises here. So we study to know the promises. Then we pray to do what? Claim the promise. I'm not talking about praying for a Maserati. I'm not talking about praying for a big boat. That's somewhere else. I'm talking about praying for peace and peace and peace. And then we have to choose to receive what God gives us in the time in which he gives us, knowing that he is walking with us. So Jesus said, if you would know this peace and not be blinded to it, if you would know the time of your visitation, you'd love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, you're to receive, receive Jesus as Savior, for he came and he gave his life as a ransom for many. He came for God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He came and said, this is my body, this is my blood for the new covenant, for the forgiveness of sins. So we're to accept his promise, we're to receive him as savior, we're to claim him, and we're to live in the promise of being people that are set free, no matter what. Number two, we're to love our neighbor as our self. This means we've got to forgive others. Remember that prayer we pray every week? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him also what? The left cheek. Pray for those not just who love you, but that who hate you and revile you. For what credit is you if you love only those that love you, even this worst sinner does that. Pray for that peace that lives in you toward other people. Forgive others. Let go of that stuff. Care for others. Serve others. Visit the prison. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked. Claim him and claim his promise that this peace also can come. And then third, yeah, somebody check that ESPN score. There we go. Da-da-da, da-da-da. Receive his internal peace. He said, lo, I'm with you always to one. The close of the age. He said in John 14, 27, I give you peace, my, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, but as I give. It's different and it's eternal. And then he says, come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then Sermon on the Mount, don't be anxious. Let the day's own trouble be enough for the day. And right before that verse, he says, but the key, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be yours as well. Receive the internal peace knowing that he walks with you, helps to remove the blinders and keeps tugging on the heart, we're never done. But he'll keep tugging, coaching, mentoring to help us find peace. Close with this, promise. There's, a, there's an old story. As a matter of fact, the story is linked to uh, um, Einstein. I, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's not. A lot of people say it's not true, so I don't know. But the story goes like this. 
a college professor, and he's talking to his group of young students, probably freshmen and sophomores in an introductory class. And that professor thinks his whole point of life is to be able to destroy their faith and show them stop having this psychological dependency on a God that's not there. Instead, embrace reality, and I'll show you a better way. So he says to the students, who believes that God created everything? Everybody raises their hands. And then he says this, while evil exists in the world, did God create evil? Group 18 and 19 year olds is absolutely, absolutely stumped. What they don't know is this is an old argument called theodicy, and it's been around for a long time, but they're 18 and 19 year olds, so they've never heard this, right? So as they're all stumped, he goes, see, stop believing this God. The God that you believe in, if he created everything, he created evil, so therefore he's not the God that you believe in. And if he didn't create evil, then he's not the God who created all things. And so for an 18 year old, that's like, ooh. So very pleased with himself, he's getting ready to go on with his lecture. And all of a sudden, this bright young man in the front row asked him a question. He said, Professor, may I ask a question? He says, yes. He says to the professor, does cold exist? The professor says, does cold exist? Of course cold exists. The rest of the students are laughing at this simple, simplistic question. Cold exists? Because we feel cold all the time. Of course cold exists. Then the student says, well, you're wrong. The professor says, what? And he begins to talk about physics. And he begins to talk about the principles of physics. And he says, all cold is, is the absence of what? Heat. We feel it, but it doesn't really exist on its own. It's an absence of something. So then the student asks, can I ask you another question, professor? The professor says, yeah. And he says, does darkness exist? Once again, the professor, a little more suspicious this time, but says, of course, darkness exists. We've, we've all seen darkness. And the student then goes on to explain some of the principles of Newton's prism. And he says, darkness really doesn't exist by itself. You know what darkness is? It's the absence of light. Well, the professor is a little ticked off at this point. And so the student asks him, can I, can I ask you one more question? The professor goes, I suppose. And he says to him, does evil exist, really? And the professor says, of course it exists. I just explained to you in the beginning of class that it exists. And you know what the student said? Evil doesn't exist in and of its own. It is only an absence of what? God. So God didn't create it. It's a chosen response to not having God. Make sense? Classic question of theodicy. Why, why do bad things happen? It's theodicy. If today you're lacking a relationship with God, if today you're lacking the peace of that relationship with God with other people, if today you're lacking the peace of God in a relationship that affects your soul, affects how you live with other people, but also you're feeling like you're lacking internal peace because something's got a hold of you and it keeps stressing you and keeps shaking you and keeps messing up your day. It's from evil and it's from a lack of enough of God. So what I want you to do Open the door. Move the mayonnaise. Say, I need more God. Whether it's here for redemption, whether it's here for forgiveness or attitude, or whether there's something in your life that's just, ah. No, today is the day of your visitation. Move the mayonnaise, move the pickles. It's right there. More God. More Jesus. Do what you need to do to get more Jesus. Lent has been all about spending time not doing this and instead spending time with God. Shutting off the computer, shutting off the TV, uh, fasting during lunch. And, uh, and when we said, it's not just letting go of something, it's getting more of him. Mayonnaise, pickles, God. More God. Choose more God.
Let's pray. Lord, we're all under construction. Some of us don't know yet that we need you to forgive us, but you're there for that. Peace comes from forgiveness. Some of us are in a spot where we're struggling with our relationship with other people, and, and, the, and the, oh, the, just the, I can't let go of it. We need more God. We need more Jesus. We need more peace. And some of us are just struggling with things all around us that they just seem to get a hold of us. It makes me upset. It makes me mad. Or oh, I'm waiting on some things with a doctor and my healing is coming so slow. Or I'm physically changed forever. And it's hard. Give us more Jesus. Give us more peace. Help us to say yes to more of you. We ask this and we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may all of God's people